So the year was uh, 1994. I was 18 years old, just graduated from high school. Some of you that you're like, really, you're that old? Some of you said, really, you're that young? Um, and I was in my home. Um, my parents, friends, and family had all gathered together for my graduation party, and people were coming and going, and there was cake on the table, and there was photos around of all those different stages of, of school from kindergarten all the way up through my senior picture. And, and as people were coming and going, there was a, a table off to the side where they could leave a, a card or a gift or, or something that they, they wanted to, um, to leave you with. And I remember seeing my high school English teacher come in. And just sort of out of the peripheral vision, I, I saw him set something on, on the table. And I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention at the time other than to sort of notice that it was just kind of an odd shape. Um, and, and as the day went on, I eventually got to the point where I was opening the gifts and opening the, the cards and looking through all that. And, and I got to his. It was wrapped in tissue paper. It had ribbon with a, a tag on it. And as soon as I touched it, I knew it was sort of unique. Um, it was heavy, uh, unlike anything else. And as I unwrapped it, this is what was in there. A brick, right? Like the thoughtful gift, like the thing that every high school kid is thinking that they're gonna need as they prepare for college. And on the tag, there was some obscure reference to this Old Testament passage in the book of Joshua, which at the time didn't mean anything to me. And, and th my English teacher was always trying to emphasize the point of like symbolism and literature. So I had some idea that there was going to be some deeper meaning to this gift that, that he wanted to get me. But at the time, I just sort of like brushed it off and thought like, well, that's weird. You know, I remember writing the thank you card. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz, for the brick that you left at my house, you know. But eventually, just sort of out of curiosity, I turned to that, that passage in Joshua, just wanting to kind of get what, what was the point of this. If I was just going to sort of throw it away or get rid of it, I, I was kind of wanted to look at the deeper meaning. And I found this passage. This is from Joshua chapter 4. This is what he had written on the tag. This is chapter 4, verses starting in, in verse 4. So just a little bit of context here. Joshua is, is the leader of the Israelite people after Moses has passed away. And this is just when Israel is about to move into the promised land. And they're standing on the Jordan River. And this is what it reads. It says, So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites one from each tribe, and he said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. And they took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over to their camp and they put them down. And Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who had carried the Ark of the Covenant stood. And they're there to this day. See, Mr. Kurtz, my, my high school English teacher, and, and he was a Christian, I went to a Christian high school, was leaving me with one more vital lesson. He was teaching me to remind myself, to, to remind myself of God's faithfulness in my life, and he was leaving me with this simple and yet significant gift that was intended to serve that express purpose. Something that would be obvious, that I would see, that would be in the way, and when I saw it, and when I bumped into it, and when I interacted with it, would, would tangibly remind me of the moments and the ways that I had seen God throughout my time in high school. Now, if you've been with us this, this summer, 
You know that we have been talking about and studying and, and, and practicing corporately these different habits that, that we integrate into our lives that are, are designed to help us connect to a deeper and a fuller sense of God's grace. And that in connecting more fully into our understanding of grace, that we might more effectively then demonstrate and live out grace in the community around us. So this whole series this summer has been titled The Disciplines of Grace. These, these practices that have a unique capacity to open us up to, to the fullness of God's grace. So these aren't things that we integrate into our life in order to accumulate more of God's favor. This isn't you and I trying to work harder so that God will find us more acceptable and in accepting us will do good things for us. No, that's not it at all. It's, it's understanding a grace that's already been accomplished on our behalf and then understanding that, living that out, living in that truth more fully. And so today we're going to talk about the practice of reminding. Things that we can do in our life in order to remember the experiences of God's faithfulness and grace as you and I seek to live out our apprenticeship uh, of Jesus. Ways that you and I can tangibly come back to the moments when God's faithfulness has been so evident and so real to us that it's undeniable and allow the truth of those experiences to inform how we live going forward. And so this morning what I wanna do is I wanna look at, at two perspectives that the practice of reminding or remembering I think provides us with. I, I wanna look at, at what it means to look back and then I also want us to talk a bit about how this informs or helps us look forward. So as we think about this first perspective, the perspective, the one that seems most obvious to us when we read a passage like that, which we just saw in the, in the book of Joshua, we, we, we intuitively think about the idea of being reminded of something or remembering about the process of, of looking back. I don't know um, if people still do this or not. Maybe, maybe you did, but when I got married, one of the traditions that people did or that they taught you was to keep the top tier of your wedding cake. Did anybody do this? Just me? Okay. All right. So it wasn't just me. And the idea behind this is that you were supposed to take the top tier of your wedding cake and put it in the freezer. And then on your one year anniversary, take it out and thaw it out and, and eat some of your wedding cake, right? which is really great in concept. Like there's so much about taste and smell that is supposed to like evoke memory for us and that does, but it turns out that one year old wedding cake is just horrible, right? Like if you're, if you're going to do this, actually just have the baker make like another little piece of cake. Cause my wife and I took that thing out and we thawed that out and we took a bite and I like instantly you could sort of feel like food poisoning coming on. Like this is not, something isn't right here. So don't eat one year old cake, but that's the lesson for today. Everyone write that down. <laughs> but the point of that practice, right, is that this, this piece of cake, what you're looking at, it's supposed to take you back to that moment a year ago when you stood across from your spouse and you spoke those vows and you committed yourself to them and it's supposed to take you back to a place where all of this is reminded and so that you can, at that one year celebration, be, be reminded of the significance of, of what took place one year ago. It's the importance of, of reminded. I want to I wanna jump back for a moment. We're going to look at another passage this morning that teaches us to remember. And it's really around sort of some of the same context, same timing. But this, this example is actually on the other side of the Jordan River. And it's with the leader that preceded Joshua. It's with Moses. It's found in the book of Deuteronomy. At this point in time, Israel has been wandering around the desert for some 40 years. And Deuteronomy, if you read through it, it's, it's really a book of preparation. Moses now recognizes that, that the time has come where God is going to lead the people in the, into the promised land, that their environment is going to change dramatically. And as he's preparing them for this, 
As he's getting them ready for this new season in their faith journey, he says, we need to pause here and remember what God has done. We need to, we need to teach ourselves to, to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness in the wilderness as we enter in to the promised land. So if you have your Bibles, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to look kind of collectively at, at what Joshua is setting up for the people of Israel, what Moses is instructing the people of Israel with, and talk about our own understanding of this and our own faith journeys. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that, God, that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. And observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. And Moses goes on like this really throughout this chapter and, and beyond. He says things as, as specifically, as poignantly says, remember so that you don't forget. Remember in order that you don't forget. There's a couple aspects of this remembering that I just want us to, to process as you think about what it means to look back. And the first thing that, that seemed to be central to both Joshua and Moses as they're laying this out for the people of Israel is to remember who God is. Remember who God is. Again, I think this, this perhaps sounds obvious, but, but both of them emphasize this in the teaching of that what they're teaching Israel to remember, to focus on the character of God. And really, I would say specifically on the reality or the experience of God as the covenant keeper. At the center of what they want to remember about him is the promise that they're about to experience, that they're walking into, that they're entering into the, the promised land, and that God was the one who fulfilled this promise. Moses elaborates a little bit on this in, in verse 2. He says, remember how the Lord led you all the way in the wilderness. Well, led you to what? To the experience of what God had promised them. That, and this is really important here. God was leading even in the wandering. 40 years spent in the wilderness because when they're coming out of Egypt, there was this lack of faith and there was this disobedience in the people. And so so God put them into this season of waiting, but he did not leave them there. He was guiding them in the waiting. From the point in time that, that the people of Israel left Egypt and escaped slavery, from the, to this moment when they are on the other side of the Jordan River, there has been moment after moment where they questioned God and his guidance and his care and his purpose in their lives. But now, with the benefit of, of hindsight, Moses calls them to look back and to see the journey as a whole, and he says, look where God has brought you. That the one who made the promise is faithful, that he's good, that he's dependable. See his care and his provision. See, let's pause here for just a moment. Because if you are anything like me, one of the seasons in life that I have a tendency to be forgetful is when life is difficult and painful, when I'm feeling a sense of desperation in my life. It's, it's, it's a season when I can be really susceptible to missing God's presence and and his activity in my life. And oftentimes it's not until I'm sort of on the other side of that that I, I look back and I can retroactively see how God was, was working or leading me all the way, but in the midst of it, in the experience of it, I was missing it. And so as, 
as Moses is, is processing and preparing the people of Israel for what lies in front of them, and as Joshua has now just taken them on the other side of the Jordan River, they say to the people, don't forget who God is. Don't forget him as, as the one who keeps his covenant. In addition to remembering who God is, though, then, then Moses and Joshua also want to emphasize that when we remember who he is, we also remember what God can do. We also remember what God can do. When I was a kid, I, I, I was always like a, a tinker. Like I was always taking stuff apart most of the time, totally incapable of, of putting it back together. Like I disassembled my bike multiple times. And I remember this one time I was, for whatever reason, trying to take the tire off my bike, the wheel. And I was just, had the socket wrench out, I had my dad's tools, and I was just putting every ounce of strength I had into loosening that bolt. And it felt like hours out there of just trying to break this rusty bolt loose from my bike and totally incapable of doing it. And I remember my dad coming home from, from work and asking me what I was doing and and whatever I was doing, I explained it to him, and he, he grabs the, the wrench, the, the socket wrench, and he just sort of puts his weight behind it, and you could just see that bolt breaking loose and coming off. And I remember thinking in that moment, like, there's things he can do that I can't do, right? See, this, this is, seems to be the point that Moses and, and Joshua want the people to be cognizant of and their faith, to be understanding of there's things that he can do that we can't do. And, and, and both instances here, you're dealing with a group of people that have experienced the miraculous. In fact, Joshua, if you flip back to Joshua, he, he recognizes this in, in verse 23. He, he recognizes how in both instances, this is a group of people that have watched God dry up a body of water so that an entire nation of people can cross on dry land only to then have that water be filled back in. He says, for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you crossed over. And the Lord did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. But, but remember what followed the Red Sea. Remember how they got into the wilderness and there was scarcity and there was, there was a, a doubt and there was, was disobedience. They looked around them and they wondered, what are we going to do now? And I, I, I think about this all the time, somewhat judgmentally, where you think that somebody in the, the crowd would have been like, well, remember that super cool thing that... that he did with the Red Sea where the water dried up. Maybe, maybe he's got this under control, right? Like maybe, maybe he's going to be able to feed us and maybe he's going to be able to. And, and I think about this and you think like, how did they, how did they miss this? And then I recognize that I, I live on the other side of the cross. I live on an even greater miracle that I've experienced personally, the transformative power in my life personally, and I forget so sometimes when I'm reading this and I'm thinking, how did they miss that? Then I need to like look a little inward and understand my own capacity towards, towards forgetting. See here when, when Joshua and, and Moses are teaching the people of Israel, they say, remember his character. Remember that, that he is covenant keeper. But also remember his capacity. Remember what he is capable of that he's able to do. It, one of the examples I've seen of somebody who lived this out so powerfully, not, not personally seen, but read about, is a man by the name of George Mueller. Maybe some of you have heard his story. Um, 1830s, uh, starting orphanages in, in England. And just when, when God called him to do this, he had this sincere conviction that he was not supposed to ask anyone for money. So he wouldn't stand up in front of other followers of Jesus and say, hey, here's the vision and here's what's going on. And if you want to give to this, we'd totally appreciate your help. He just felt convicted he was never supposed to do that. And so he lived in this total dependency on, 
on prayer. And if you read his biography, you'll see that time after time, desperate need after desperate need, their only option was to go before God in prayer, and God was faithful in every instance. And you saw this sort of growing expectation in George Mueller, where experience after experience of God's faithfulness of what he was able to do began to shape or create in him the idea of of God will come through for us because he's able to. Whether it was like, there's no food for tomorrow. And then a wagon would break down in front of the orphanage and say, look, I'm never gonna make this delivery. Can you guys use this food? I mean, crazy stuff like that. He had expectation because he knew what God was able to do and because he had seen it. Which brings us to this this third component of, of the look back. We, re- we remember who God is, we remember what he can do, but then we also remember who we are. See, Joshua and, and Moses here, they, they want the results of this memorying to, to not only produce a more accurate understanding of God, but also to remind the people of their need apart from him and of God's transformative work in their lives. Moses, after talking about how God had provided and guided and sustained the people and all that they had received up to this point in the wilderness, he said that this was a time that that was used to humble and to test and to discipline in their lives. And Moses wants them to hold on to that, to remember that. What God has revealed about themselves. See, that this was a season of refinement for the people where pride had been exposed and, and sin had been confronted and where they were able to, there, were, there was no way that they could live in self-reliance. It wasn't an option in the wilderness. And it humbled them. And Moses says, we need to remember what we've learned about ourselves. We, re, we need to remember what God has, has revealed to us in the wilderness. The Spanish philosopher and and poet George Santayana famously wrote in The Life of Reason that those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. See, Moses is essentially teaching the people of Israel the same thing. That in the wilderness, remember that we experienced firsthand God's salvation. We, we, We experienced by literally manna showing up on the ground, his graceful provision for us. And he's saying to the people as they're preparing to to leave the wilderness into an environment that that is starkly and drastically different, right? Like they're, they're going to something that's been described as a land flowing with milk of honey, where there's provision and 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 a sense of ease and settling and comfort. And Moses says, as we enter into this, as Joshua is preparing to lead them in, don't forget what we've learned about ourselves and our need for his grace and salvation. See, the other, the other time and season of life that I have a tendency to be forgetful is when things are going well, is when I'm comfortable. Like, right, when the bills are paid and the kids are fed and everybody is just sort of like, I'm just, you're killing it, right? Everything is going as it should. And in that season, I, I kind of get in this tendency where I'm kind of like, I've really got things under control here, you know? You relate to that? See here, Moses knows, Joshua knows what they're walking into. And it's drastically different than what they're leaving. And he says, we need to remember. We need to remember who God is. We need to remember what he can do. And we need to remember how that has transformed us, how it's changed us. But then this leads us to this this second perspective. And that is really a a look forward. How this reminding that that God teaches us to do, how it helps shape our our faith and our walk with him as we move forward. um, One of the things my wife has done over the years is she's created these little scrapbooks of when each one of our daughters was little. Um, This is Laney's. I always mentioning this that I was going to use this as an illustration to the kids and Lainey said take my dad I was the cutest (laughs) so I love to look through these right and you you see these little pictures of when she was tiny and and um 
Then you recall all the memories and how adorable these tiny little feet are. And you know, as parents, like we love to do this. But part of what I love about this is, is when Lainey will sit down with me and, and look at these together. Because she doesn't remember this. Like she doesn't, she doesn't know these stories. She doesn't know about the time that, that we celebrated her first birthday or her first Christmas. She doesn't know about the trip to the beach that we took. She doesn't have any functioning memory of these events in her life. Look at that cupcake picture. I mean, come on. <laughs> she ate a cupcake like that till she was like 13 years old, by the way. See, the, the scrapbook, it, it, it serves to remind me of this season of life, of what we experienced and how much we loved it and all these fun stories, but it also provides me the opportunity to tell the story. It, it gives me a chance to sit down with her and to talk about that season of life and, and what that means. And here, Joshua seems to emphasize this in, in the point of, of remembering, of being reminded. It's this, this aspect, this element of, of what we're called to do as we are reminded of who God is and what he can do and how he's changed us. It's, it's, it's intended to direct us forward. Again, if you look at Joshua chapter 4, verse 21, it says, He said to the Israelites, In the future when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. And the Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. And he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. See, the discipline of remembering, of, of, of being reminded of God's faithfulness is an opportunity to tell the story. It's an opportunity to pass on the experience and the knowledge of who God is and what he can do and it changes and how it's changed us and, and to tell the next generation. It's one of our fundamental responsibility as parents. It's part of what we'll talk about at, at the Parenting Summit. How do we do that? What, what are ways that we practice this? It, it's, part, it's a fundamental responsibility for you and I as adults in the life of the church to pass this on to the generation behind us, to, to tell the story of God's faithfulness, of the way that he has revealed himself to us. And so I wanna, I wanna just ask you a few questions here to think about. Do you remember a time when God's presence in your life, his activity, was so obvious to you that you could not deny it or dismiss it? Like one of those moments when you're like, this is, this is God at work here. Do you, do you remember a time when his provision for you was personal and it was specific? Like where, where he moved and worked in such a way that only he could have known that you needed that in that moment and only he had the power to provide it. Can you think of a time when God proved himself to be faithful, where you saw it firsthand? Because this is our challenge this week, it is to create a reminder to, to set something up in our lives, something tangible and visible. It can be a scrapbook. It can be something as silly as a brick that you keep on your desk. That when you look at it, it reminds you of the answer to that question. And that when someone else sees it or they ask what this is about, you, you can say, let me tell you the story. Let me tell you how God provided this incredible way. Or let me tell you how he just met me in this this really personal way. This week, as we've done each week, as we've talked about practicing these disciplines, I, I want you to identify, and it does not have to, it's, it's more important that it's personal to you. It does not have to be some dramatic moment, but that moment that you know, and create something in your world that reminds you of that. See, when Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, he. He took something as everyday and as ordinary as bread 
And he handed it to him and he said, this is my body, which I'm, I'm about to give for you. He said, when you eat this, remember me. Jesus understood how important it would be for us as his followers to remember. To remember who he is. To remember what he's done. And to remember how it has transformed us. Because the reality of that past shapes our future. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to come together and to, and to remember. To remember the ways that you have worked and moved in us individually. To remember corporately your faithfulness, even in, in the life of the church and bringing us out here, how we have seen you work. And so, God, I pray that as we talk about ways that we can experience a deeper and fuller sense of your grace, that you would teach us to remember so that we will never forget. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.